Now, there's a, there's a patient case studies. We'll just see. I'm not sure how these are pitched and how we go. I'm happy. And I wasn't sure if there should be panel discussion or that type of thing from obviously experts like David Ross and the guys in here. So, um, but um, these are actually, and also I was given some slides to present, which were Andrew's slides. Andrew's apologies today. Um, and uh, it occurred to me, I was thinking to myself, if I, was, if I was a patient with this, would I want my stuff presented in front of me? And I thought, I don't know Andrew's patients. You could be Andrew's patients. So I've done my own patients. Um, people I know a bit better. So um, uh, they may be a bit more simplistic. We'll see how it goes. And then uh, jump in with any questions or what have you. So the first guy is a guy who's 55, um, who is uh, in the corporate world, pretty well fellow. And he went to his GP for routine blood test in February of last year and he had a a high platelet count just by itself. And then the GP repeated it again, and it was still high. Couldn't work out why, so he sent him along to a hematologist. It wasn't me. Um, and at the time, he was well. The hematologist examined him and didn't have a big spleen or anything. He said, we'll do your blood test again. Come back next week, because he hadn't rolled up with a, a recent blood test. And this is the one that was repeated. So he had a platelet count of 864, and I, my sort of default format is, if it's in red, it's abnormal. If it's not, it's normal. Um, all that stuff there. I don't know if I have how much to colour to put into this, but um, you know, when I look at an FBE, I look for clues, and as Ruben will tell you, you, you look at the numbers, you got kind of already get a, a feeling. So a well person with this kind of picture, you're thinking about ET already. Um, but you think about uh, if they have high basophils at the bottom, you think about chronic myeloid leukaemia, um, a separate disease, or high eosinophils. If you see an elevated hematocrit and other elevations, you might think of polycythemia virus. You're already thinking at this point in time, even when you receive the referral from the GP. Um, he rolled back the next week and received his result and he said, oh, I forgot to tell you something. Oh, uh, about a few weeks ago, I, I ran a marathon and a few hours later, I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't see out of my left-hand side and I couldn't speak. So I went to hospital and uh, they diagnosed him with obviously what they thought was initially a stroke. It actually ended up being, uh, I don't know, they found he had a dissection of his internal coronal artery on the other side, which would make sense. But he got better over 24 hours and he was sent home. He was actually interstate at the time, so he was sent home with... Uh, blood thinner, warfarin, aspirin, clopidogrel, I hope you guys know what that is. And then said, go home and get sorted out, because you don't live here. Go go home and get sorted out with the, the team at home, but you're well. Um, I, I was quite surprised he didn't say this. Uh, I, I can imagine, you know, you're seeing a hematologist, all things are going through your mind. So he said that, and the doctor who saw him said, oh, we'll send you off for some blood tests, look for any mutation that might be causing this. But you probably have a, I think the phrase used in the letter was, overactive bone marrow. So we're going to send you for a bone marrow biopsy, and he did that, and then... A few days later, that was performed, and it was shown to be consistent with a central thrombocythemia. I haven't got the report here. Uh, and he was put on to hydroxyurea, 500 milligrams, one capsule a day. And the other stuff was continued while this guy was sent off to go and see a neurologist uh, in the same building, uh, ASAP, to work out what to do about that carotid artery dissection. So I took over from the hematologist when he retired. And I met this guy, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. So when he came to see me, he'd already had hydroxyurea for a bit, and his palate kind of come down. And... Um, he told me, oh, he saw the neurologist, and the neurologist thought it was actually a stroke, and he didn't think actually, or, or what's called a TI, which is, if you don't know, is a, a stroke symptom that resolves in 24 hours. Uh, it has implications, because if you have a TIA, transient ischemic attack, you're very likely to have a stroke very soon after if you don't get sorted out quickly and find out why that happened to you. So, but this is now months later, and he hadn't had any more episodes like that. So the neurologist said, I think he's had a stroke. Not, I'm not sure what to do about that dissection business. Stop the other blood thinners he doesn't need, and uh, just leave him on the aspirin. I said, that's, that's cool. And then the mutation stage came back and they were negative. So, okay, fair enough. So we'll keep on the hydro and go from there. I saw him a few weeks later and then his platelet count was coming down further on the hydro. He was handling the hydro okay. And I said, oh, look, I think if someone's thought you had a stroke, by the books, we should try to normalise your platelet count. Well, at least try and get it lower. Now, that's a bit of a matter of debate, maybe. Um, we'll talk about it in a second. He said, I don't want to increase my hydro. I had skin cancer a while ago. I'm, I've heard that's a problem, so I don't want to in, uh, increase it anymore. I'm, 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 if you're saying I must, I must, but I, I really don't want to. Okay, all right. This is like my fifth week in private practice ever. And I was like, okay, I'll just make sure I negotiate with you. Um, I said, look, but the other thing that's happening in, in these days is you've got this new mutation testing that we can do because it's really important in your disease to find out what the mutation, the genetic mistake in your cells is that's causing your disease. It turns out that may be quite important. He said, okay, well, what, what does that involve? It's a blood test. Uh, it's... it's the government doesn't reimburse it yet, fully. Your private insurance may, but they don't. So you had to pay $200. He said, oh, what's it going to change? And I said, oh, I'm not sure. He said, I don't want to do it. I said, fine. <laughs> would anyone of the experts, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask the experts, would anyone have pushed for him to do it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Consensus. All right. So come back soon. I, try, I then went on an exercise of trying to figure out how could he not pay for it. I found out. I'll tell you later. Um, his platelet count went up, and he still didn't want to have the hydria, and he still didn't want to have the next generation sequencing. And so at this point in time, um, I, th I think this is where he's up to. Yeah. So, yeah, didn't want to have the test done. 
And but I sense I could probably push him into it, but I, didn't, I haven't yet. I think this guy I sort of summarised as having high risk of central thrombocytopenia on the basis of his prior having had what we think I think is a stroke, or at least should be regarded that way. And he's also approaching 60, so you can argue to him to try and push him a bit harder with the hydria. He was negative for the JAK2 mutation, so I, I presume he's going to have because he's had a bone marrow biopsy that shows he has the disease by the way it looks under the microscope, mm -hmm. that he will have a cal reticular mutation, which is the most common other second mutation or a mipple mutation. And the question I don't have quite sorted out in my head is what platelet target to treat to push him to, what to do with his aspirin dose, and what to do with his mutation testing. You say, well, how can, how, how can I not know that? I'm looking after him. Um, at the Austin, when we have a clinic, I don't know if you guys want to hear this, at the end of the clinic, we all sit down and everyone talks about who do they see that day. And what are the challenges? We'll talk as a group, and Andrew's there, and we're all there. And every single clinic, it's myeloproliferative neoplasms. What's your platelet target? Oh, I don't know. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I, I do this, I do this. Oh, gosh. What's going on? Like, is it not literature? So to, to me, it's, it's a challenging area. And it's an area that I'd like to try to find sort of informed by data, but sometimes it just isn't there. Um, I'm pretty confident the next time I see him, which is going to be in a few weeks' time, I'm going to tell him to have mutation testing, please. Um, and I've worked out a way to try and get it for him sorted out. Um, in Melbourne, anyway. Are you guys all from Australia? No, so if people not, some from New Zealand. Okay, I'm not sure how the, the rules are, but in Australia, currently Medicare not uh, reimbursing um, the next generation sequencing test that we ask for. We get it done at Peter McCallum or B Triple C, um, the pathology department there. And um, yeah, uh, whether it's on the horizon, we're not sure. Um, some of my colleagues have suggested that his aspirin dose could be lower than once a day on the basis that if he had a cow reticular mutation, the risk of bleeding might be might be more present. So some people have uh, advocated a three times a week aspirin dose. Uh, I'm comfortable living on once a day at the current time. Um, and I'm pretty keen to normalise his platelet count. So I'd be interested to know from the, the people like uh, Professor Mesa and David what you think about that. Mm. I'll give a personal insight that when I started training, that's exactly what I would have said. And then as I've gone through, I now discover a lot of people doing different things. And I don't, it's, it's quite, it's hard to know, particularly uh, in, in different spheres of healthcare, private, public, different cl clinicians. People go to Ash, hear something, come back and say, oh, let's do something a bit different. It's quite challenging sometimes. You, to, to me, this is as straightforward as I can see, from, apart from the, maybe the dissection part, and yet I, s I still find it, like, you could just niggle at me and say, oh, no, he doesn't need, like, he could tell me I, I don't want hydria increased, and I'd say, okay, all right. That's, that's the book. Um, all right. Questions can come any time if you like, just interrupt. I'll just barrel on. Case two. Go for it. Hmm. What difference do you think it make to have those results from the gene mutation sequencing or knowing those whether you have the nipple or the cow? Does that actually inform your um, treatment decisions? Some of my colleagues will give aspirin three times a week to um or not or, uh, to high risk ET with a cow reticular mutation on the flavour that there's more of a bleeding profile with those patients. I, I don't know if that's backed. But Andrew, we have to look at the individual patient. These patients come with strokes. Mm. His risk factor is his ET. So that trumps, to me, the other factors. Because you can look at all the paperwork, but the person sitting in front of you, at a 55-year-old who's run a marathon or whatever it was, has had a stroke, and if it affects him, it's not a dissection. You have to look at that risk, that risk. And therefore, that doesn't matter what his mutation status is, he's actually had a clot, mm. he's got freshest platelets, he has aspirin, which is the best we can do for him, not what the data might show that this risk or that risk or the cow mm. are. That's how I So, does that mean you would be happy for him to not have a mutation test? Because I, I, I'm comfortable he has a diagnosis. Mm. It's cost a lot of money. I therefore have to think very carefully about ways of then participating in a trial, which many of my patients did, and got tested for the heat amount without mm. cost, mm. or um, paying for it. And I have to think about what difference will it make for the patient. Mm. And um, we like to have that data, but often it won't make a difference. And we shouldn't treat this patient on the basis of his mutations. We should treat the patient on the basis of the patient. Mm. 
Mm. No need to apologise, I like that answer. Absolutely. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay. Case two. So, um, so I started the Austin about a year and a half ago. Um, I've been there my whole career and then went away for a bit and then came back. And one of the things I did was uh, people who were retiring and winding down, I sort of inherited their patients. Um, one guy I memorably met is a 60-year-old man who is salt of the earth guy from a uh, European area. The cleaner, he had once, I lost his son at the Austin a year ago. Um, he had, a, I like to prepare for my patients. When I saw his name on the list, I looked up his notes and what have you. And he, he had a diagnosis of polycythemia vera from 2009. And somewhere along the way, he had a jack 2 mutation found uh, as part of his workup. Why not at the start? I'm not sure, but he ended up having that, that uh, in the notes. He was on two hydrogen a day. He was on aspirin once a day. He has some sections every now and then. He had this history of recurrent gout, high blood pressure, but never had a blood clot as far as could be shown. That was indicative blood counts the first time I saw him. Um, elevated white cell count, uh, neutrophil count, high blood count. Been like this actually for quite a long time. Um, and on the first time, when I looked at his blood test, he had unusual comments in the blood film area. He had teardrop cells, which some of you will know are cells that aren't normal in the blood. Um, that can be sometimes seen in myelofibrosis, as can what's called a left shift, where the white cells, instead of being your neutrophils, are some of the early ones that aren't supposed to be in the blood, including blasts, which are obviously the very starting point of, uh, of the myeloid cells. So this is not normal. This doesn't make sense. This is not quite polycythemia vera. I was thinking to myself, I reckon I mean, this guy's going to have myelofibrosis. But why is it, why is it saying that he's got polycythemia vera? I guess let's find out. I saw him, and he had a massive spleen. Well, not massive, he had a big spleen. It had been written down before. Spleen enlarged, spleen enlarged. And draw a little diagram, spleen enlarged. And I said to this guy, uh, without the interpreter, who hadn't come, which is common uh, sometimes, um, I think you have, your disease is getting worse, it's more advanced, sort of completely blankly. Uh, I think you have something in the bone marrow causing fibres, which is not part of your original disease. I think so. This is still treatable, but I think you need to, um, I think we need to figure out what's happening to your bone marrow. He said, I had a bone marrow. I said, okay, well, I'll try, I'll try and find it, because it wasn't on my records. So I rang up, and someone rang it, read out the conclusion to me, uh, this is often quite a comical experience. Um, they, they, they read it out, and I, just, I couldn't work out what that really meant. It didn't sound like my fibrosis, but I said, I'll fax it to me, and as often happens, you don't get it quite straight away. So I said to the patient, look, um, come back in a, few, a couple weeks' time with the interpreter. We'll just try and sort you out. This is a bit sort of, I'm not quite sure what, what's going on here. Come back in two weeks later. So his, uh, his hydrogen re re remained the same. His uh, neutrophil count had come down a little bit. So he had fluctuated over time. He had a venesection, which is why hemocrit was, was down a bit. He had these abnormal cells in the blood still. So I was still really worried about this situation. And I found the bone marrow biopsy report eventually. And just so there's more, there's more than this, but this is my summary of it. So in the liquid part, the aspirate, he had no extra blasts. He had normal levels of iron, um, which is something that's relevant in polycythemia vera. But his, his trephine was, uh, the, the solid part of the bone marrow was very full of cells. Lots of lots of uh, granulocytic hyperplasia, which means all the, the neutrophils in there, guys. Uh, too many of them, too many of the megakaryocytes make the platelets, making clusters, and uh, the reticulum, which is the bone marrow fibres, are increased as well. I read all that, I think oh, he's got myelofibrosis, but the conclusion didn't say that. Now, why does that matter? I was thinking to myself, well, you need to have a conclusion that says myelofibrosis to go and apply for medications in Australia, if you want to get ruxolitinib. So I th the conclusion just said myeloproliferative disorder. So, oh, okay, all right. Um, now, you can always go and get, get it out of the laboratory and get someone to review it and write another report. But anyway, so I sat down with him, I sort of, was going to say all this stuff, and he just unleashed on me. You, I haven't seen you ever before, the doctors before me have said this, now you're saying this. What are you, you trying to scare me? What are you talking about? I'm completely well, I gout every now and then, I have intersections, I'm okay. I don't know what you're talking about. It was a very volatile conversation. Um, he said, I don't want any treatment, I don't want a bone marrow biopsy. And then we left it at that. Afterwards, I rang his GP, he speaks the same language as him, had a long chat, and it's something that was personality factors. But I don't doubt for a second that seeing a new doctor who you haven't seen, who, different to your doctor for the last five years, telling you something different is naturally impactful. So I thought, hmm, okay, what are we going to do here? I believe something, he doesn't believe it, should I work it out? So he came back a few weeks later, actually, he missed a few appointments, and then there he came back. It's important to say, at this point, the interpreter we were using, we realised afterwards, was possibly not interpreting the right things. Anyway. Um, 
just, it, it happens, it happens. It's, uh, not a, it's a comment on the individual, not the institution. Um, so his numbers are still bouncing around. He's now getting recurrent gout and tells me that his main treatment for this gout is some sort of powder he gets from, from overseas, from his home country. Still big spleen. And I said to him, look, I think your, your numbers are getting worse. And I showed it to him. I said, look, they're going up. And he said, okay, we'll increase the hydrate, have some more venter sections. I'm just trying to work on him to try and get him to the point where I think he can actually uh, buy into my, my idea. I don't know. I, I guess there are some people who are sort of just push it and say, you need to do this full stop. And I suppose I have thought about that. The numbers continue to sort of bounce around and my hope, attempts to improve them were sort of going on. And he ended up seeing his GP. He ended up giving him some, some gout therapy that's sort of, you know, standard allopurinol on culture. He's still having recurrent gout, missing days of work. Um, and this is what we're up to now where I've suggested he could have a treatment which I think would work for his gout. It will certainly help his counts. He's on a lot, fair bit of hydria. He's tolerating it okay, um, and he can go to three tablets a day. But I think you need to have a bone marrow biopsy. Otherwise, I'm not sure I can get this drug for you necessarily. I think it would help you a lot. Um, he's currently said no, but he's a lot more friendly with me now. Um, <laughs> and I'm hopefully not too far away. Um, and I think one of the interesting things I've discovered, as, as I've just disclosed, I've inherited... I've actually inherited quite a few different practices of the last three years just from moving around and being a, a young consultant. You see some stuff and you sort of think, how did they end up here? And you sort of wonder, why do they have this label, this diagnosis, this far down the track? And sometimes it, it's... I, I don't really know the answer sometimes. Sometimes you wonder if the patient just hasn't wanted to hear it, or sometimes you just don't know if the doctor hasn't been able to say it. Um, I don't know how this guy sort of went along for having, having this... Enlarged spleen and, and no attempts to read bone marrow biopsy this whole time. I, I could have inferred it could be a personality factor, and there was some suggestion of that from the GP. Um, but this is, I found, a really tangible issue that kind of blocks a bit what you want to do as a doctor. I, mean, I don't know if you guys, Cecily Dave, have similar patients in your practice, but um, you, know, you try to get to... And I think it's all, also a lot easier to come in from the start and do it how you want to do it rather than inheriting a situation that's been established for eight or nine years. Comments welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, the, the third and final case is one that um, happened quite, is happen, happening at the moment. It's a man, again, who I inherited... Actually, I didn't inherit this guy. This guy had a hematologist at the Austin. And I came along, and one of my hats I have is an allergenic transplanter, which is a service we only recently sort of developed at the Austin in the last 18 months. Um, this man, a 67-year-old man, uh, still working full-time, um, uh, had a history of ET going back uh, several years. Never any symptoms from it. Never had a blood clot. Um, was JAK2 negative. And initially, this had been treated with hydroxyurea. Um, then, because of difficulty controlling his counts, he wanted to anagrelide. Um, and he was on this kind of... He'd be coming quite stably, happily, to see the, the specialist every three months. Hi, how are you going? Here are your blood counts. Here's your medications. Off you go. Very, you know, very stable. And that was until mid-2016 that things started to go wrong for this fellow. So he had... It's hard to read, sorry. Um, he, had, he had this sort of pattern of just abnormal blood counts, um, sort of often running sort of in, in the low levels of neutrophils um, and, and haemoglobin. Um, uh, and despite sort of attempts to try and manoeuvre his medications, never sort of really quite got anyone's satisfaction. And then I think what happened is um, he went out for a holiday, he came back in, uh, after three months, and he had some teardrop cells, and finally the decision was made, okay, we need to do a bone marrow biopsy, and he was very happy to have one. Um, and he had myelofibrosis, fibrosis, as was probably, as was actually flagged him. At this stage, obviously, I said before, he was JAK2 negative. Um, they requested next generation sequencing on the marrow uh, for this patient. Um, and this is what happens at, in Pinamac. You get these mutations tested for when you ask for next generation sequencing. I think you can ask for one, but I think for whatever reason, yeah, people do the whole shebang. So all these little crazy letters are things that have been identified in literature that can be uh, things that drive um, uh, myeloid cancer. And some are sort of particularly, as you can see, Jack 2's there and Cal out at the top. And um, these are things that are... We're kind of looking for certain things. We're not initially expecting to look for other stuff necessarily. It's just the way they run their panel. You can probably guess by what I'm saying, that they found something they weren't expecting to. So they did this kind of because they wanted to identify his mutation. And we just talked a bit about whether that's even relevant to do, if it's going to change your management. But because he hadn't had a mutation identified and we could do it, we did it. And he had a cal-reticular mutation, which probably no surprise, which often run, the type 1 mutation does tend to run with the ET patients having a high chance of fibrosis. But he had this thing called TP53. I'm not sure people know much about TP53. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to see. 50, TP53 is a mutation that kind of implies that your genome can't defend itself. If you make a mutation in the stem cell, um, you try to fix it or repair it. If you hit the repair guy, then you can't repair it. And fundamentally, you get continued instability of your stem cell clone. It's a really un unlucky mutation. Um, it implies that something bad is about to happen. 
And certainly this has been born out in the literature in myelofibrosis and ET, well, not so much, certainly myelofibrosis, that you're at high risk of progressing to acute leukemia if you have this mutation. Um, so this caused his hematologist at the Austin a bit of confusion. He said, hmm, he's going to, this sounds very bad. He's quite well now. He's very fit, in fact. Should he have an allogeneic transplant on the basis of that he's got, he's actually got no symptoms at all and his blood counts aren't really that bad. Um, but this marker, what does it mean? And as Ruben said before, like it is really, really, really difficult to talk to someone about allogeneic transplant for this, for this set of diseases. I find it incredible. I find, so I, I would say it's the most challenging medical procedure that there is, the most dangerous thing you could ask for to want. And I almost think, feel sometimes it's actually unfair and a symptom burden to tell the patient about it. This could cure you, but it could kill you, you know, and the chances are this or this. So dichotomous the outcomes, it, is, it must be very stressful. I had to do it quite a few times now, and uh, I always find myself quite conflicted. Um, he didn't have any siblings as well, so that was, it had to be from an unrelated donor, which these days is probably a bit more happy about as being not to... In the old days, that was a, a difficult thing to do a transplant with. Um, so I saw him again. I, I explained to him the idea uh, about an hour, as is quite usual, what it's involved, the idea, the principle, how bad it could be, how good it could be. Um, and he said, oh, look, I'll, I'm interested. And it's a bit sort of... 67 is quite old to go for this. It's done probably a bit more in the US than it is here. Um, but it was certainly a lot of discussion with the group. Is this really the right thing to do because... Um, if you did this for all 67-year-olds in this situation, there'd be no more money left in the country to run Medicare um, because of the sheer expense of an allergenic transplant. But, and that's a, that's a separate discussion, if for this patient in front of us who's got a good quality of life, uh, let's explore it. And the question also came up, should you take roxalitinib without symptoms at all? No big spleen, just well. Should we? So we weren't sure about that, the latter question. Uh, I think it was applied for, actually, um, by his original haematologist. We looked for a donor. So I mean, later on, he's becoming more anemic, as we expect from his disease, so we started to reduce his uh, medications. And then in February, I saw him and he had some blasts on his blood film, only a few months after that result from his bone marrow. And all the discussion we had about allergenic transplant just went away because he had acute leukemia. He came in with high fevers and he's still in a situation where he's getting treatment now, but he's uh, a very well guy, but just plagued with high fevers every day, and despite our attempts to treat his leukemia. And ironically, the day that I told him he had leukemia, someone from my donor centre rang and said, oh, we found a donor for him. Now, I'm, I must admit, I sort of don't know philosophically if that would have made a difference because I think that by the time you found that result to organise a transplant, probably the time, you know, would it have made a difference and no one knows the answer. But um, it illustrates how... And I, I reflected on that patient as... I sort of wonder, should I even have the, had the discussion and given him three months of a ray of hope when actually probably, you know, if I'd known what I would have known now, I would have just sort of kept things a bit more light. Um, but, um, so I guess my takeaway from doing this for the first time is that... Um, I can't imagine how complicated it is for you guys. It must be unbelievably challenging having to navigate what Ruben was talking about with the symptoms and everything, as well as some of these more um, bigger picture things. And just understand that these, sometimes it's difficult to find consensus amongst what we do. Um, these cases have been chosen because I kind of think it's, I don't know, from my point of view as a, as a physician, having been a patient before with various things, it's quite nice to be able to be able to have a really intellectual and philosophical discussion with your do doctor. And, for, and I know some, I've had patients before who ask for the paper or can you show me the evidence? And I, I personally quite like that. I think it's really uh, enriching to be partners in healthcare rather than me just telling you what to do. Um, but um, yeah, um, if anyone has any questions or things you want to ask or, um, yeah, but thanks for indulging me. <laughs>